You're making history. In fact, you're making me. And I wish you'd keep my hands to yourself. Welcome to the Marx Brothers Council Podcast. This is episode number seven, Too Late, That's Monkey Business Already. I'm Bob Gassell, and I'm once again joined by my two lovely co-hosts. First of all, Mr. Matthew Coniam, all the way from jolly old... Um, uh, England. England in, in Britain. Uh, Hello, everybody. And coming to us from an even more jolly place, New York City, we welcome Mr. Nash Noah Diamond. <laughs> Hello, yes, it's a pleasure to be here with a little something to nosh on. <laughs> and we're gathered here today, we're going to talk about uh, one of the great Marx Brothers films. I think uh, everyone who's a Marx fan will agree, we're going to talk about Monkey Business. Yeah. All right. The third film and their first one made in Hollywood. And, you know, in my opinion, it's a very underrated film, not necessarily in terms of quality, because most Marx fans will put it in their top handful of films. But I think it's underrated in how important it is and how unusual it is. And it's a hair of a drop off for me from Animal Crackers, but in its own way, it's a step in a new direction. And I think it was the direction they had to go. Absolutely right. Yes. It's their, it's their first Hollywood movie. It's, it's their first movie and it, and it feels like a movie right away. It moves like a movie. The scenes are short. Uh, there's lots of lots of fast cutting. It, it's not big chunks uh, sketches, which weirdly MGM sort of brought back that idea of it all being in chunks. This is very very cinematically uh, arranged, and of course uh, for me personally, it's a very sacred film because it was my first. I'm looking now, in fact, right in front of me on my lap at the Radio Times, which is the BBC television uh, listings magazine, 23rd of December, 1983, 10.30 p.m., Monkey Business, the first of five films shown over that Christmas and uh, the moment when my life changed. Um, and that's not me kind of looking back and putting a gloss on it. I, I, I woke up on the 24th of December and, and spent the rest of Christmas talking about nothing else. And I've, I've talked about little else since. Do you think if you had come across like the big store first, you would have kept watching that's a very good question because it went one one assumes not and yet you know we've encountered many many people who did who started with big store with love happy with room service and they just saw something there that was worth following up but i'm so lucky that i i, I came to them with monkey business yeah i think you couldn't do better as a first marx brothers film and Whenever people ask the question, you know, I'm trying to turn a friend on to the Marx Brothers, where should we start? <laughs> Monkey Business is the most common and I think the best answer. It's the one of their films that feels the most like a uh, contemporary comedy. It has maybe fewer barriers to entry for someone who's not used to films mm -hmm. of this era. Uh, and it just has this kinetic energy to it that's sort of irresistible. And even though I think all three of us are on the page of liking the stage boundness of coconuts and animal crackers and not thinking of that as a flaw, it still must be admitted that monkey business is just an excellent piece of work. And it does make them cinematic in a way that I think you're right, Bob, had to happen. And, you know, let's talk about this. In addition to them being out in Hollywood doing a, basically a different type of format, they're working with basically all new writers. You know, the, everything we've seen Previously, it's been, you know, under the George S. Kaufman pen, and we're, we're, we're getting a different approach to the Marxists in this. Although film. we have Johnstone back, of course. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and Johnstone back from I'll Say She Is. And, and, and yet this, the excellence of monkey business does contradict, you know, it not only doesn't have Kaufman and Riskin, it doesn't have Kalmar and Ruby. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea that they made a film this good from a screenplay this good without any of those four gentlemen whose surnames begin with K's and R's. <laughs> <laughs> well, to elaborate on that, they took the four characters that we knew, but everything else about their film about their presentation about how they were being presented was tossed out the window from animal crackers they took groucho out of the leadership position they didn't have the big production number at the front they didn't have the separate romantic uh subplot what's exactly, interesting yeah. is that a lot of these things that they took away did come back within a couple of films virtually all these things did yeah, come back you, eventually you can't help thinking that if they didn't have kalma and ruby back next time this might have served as the as the prototype for the next four films 
It also reaffirms that their characters are the strongest element in their work, much stronger than whatever the mechanics of a storyline they're given. Like, yes, this this screenplay doesn't give Groucho an authority role to play. Nevertheless, he kind of remains the ringleader. He's the one who impersonates the captain. You know, the personalities are what they are. And the in later and earlier films, the stories were written for those personalities. And with or without that kind of storyline here in monkey business those personalities just have free reign exactly and that seems very deliberate i think they're 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 not given characters are they they're only given characteristics but the the plot is very deliberately set up i think so that we don't know who they are they're stowaways they're people without real names they're obviously not related because uh chico keeps talking about his grandfather and his father yeah i counted four times in the film he brings up his grandfather yeah yeah so so it's it's almost like they've deliberately said let's take the essence of these personas and take everything else away so that's all we've got are the other characteristics um the reason i think this one maybe falls just a hair below their best for me is that i miss groucho being in that in that upper echelon, in that uh, authority um, position. I think some of his lines, I think they're just as funny as other stuff that was been written for him, but coming from somebody who's basically a a, a bum, you know, <laughs> uh, doesn't carry as much weight as, as to a yes. president or a head of a university. Or He's got nothing to authority. lose, yeah. Yeah. I think in our very first podcast episode, I – embarked on the sheer folly of applying a scientific point system to Max <laughs> Brothers films mm-hmm. and uh, just just to be as ridiculous as possible. And, um, and it did turn out that Monkey Business suffered a lot under that kind of system because so many of the archetypal Marx Brothers strengths are not here, including Margaret Dumont, including songs, including many of, a lot of what we expect from their storylines. <laughs> um, and yet, uh, as testament to what folly that system was, um, it's pretty hard to argue with the greatness of this film or with its importance to who they are and were. And, you know, we tend to talk about the character names a lot. They are just called Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and Zeppo in this movie. Um, but it's we're not really violating an established precedent yet. Uh, at this point on film, Groucho had been called Mr. Hammer mm. and Captain Spaulding. It, it's really in Horse Feathers that all those conventions begin. Mm. Well, I do have a theory about who Groucho actually is here, but I will get to that when we come to it. <laughs> the little fellow who talks too much? Well, I, I do want to bring up one interesting thing here that I noticed this time that I'm surprised I hadn't noticed before. Gr- Groucho and Zeppo's relationship is totally different here than any, any other time. Groucho does not talk down to him. He doesn't insult them. You know, they're they're basically comrades here. Yes. There's none of that negative He's not subservient. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he, doesn't, he doesn't have any singers at Zeppo's expense. That's true. And, and Zeppo's role in the team is much, it's much more equal here. He's sort of allowed to be who he is and his particular idiosyncrasy is not having any. He probably had to show up for work more days here than in any other film. Yeah, and he probably didn't mind it as much. <laughs> it's interesting, actually, isn't it? Because I've said in one of the earlier podcasts that the only reason Zeppo could possibly be one of that gang is if he had a had a role. So he's always working for Groucho, or, or he's related to Groucho. Here he isn't, but but he's given he's given that function because therefore they're the four stowaways, and they've obviously kind of met, and there's the kind of the brotherhood of of stowaways. So that's what brings them together, even though obviously he's not a, a zany character in any anything like the way they are. Yeah, we don't even know whether they knew each other before the cruise. I assume that. No, that's right. That's right. We we presume they haven't. I think. I think they've they've bonded in the in the commonality of of uh, the barrels. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Groucho says he used to live in the next barrel to me. That's the closest we ever get mm. to a background, mm. a, a backstory for them. Mm-hmm. So should we get into this? Let's get into this. Yeah. Why not? All right. First of all, it's good to know that this is the film has been approved by all, all the local film boards. Hey, that's yeah. early. We, Phew. We would not be talking about it if it wasn't. Yeah. So after we get through our wonderful title sequence with the rolling barrels. Beautiful. We're, we're yeah. seeing a cruise ship on en route from where to where. We don't know. We learn. London, I think. Well, we learn about three quarters of the way through the film exactly uh, where it's from. We never learn exactly where they're going. We could well, there's a shot of the New York skyline when they arrive. They're going to New York, and and they and the uh, Helton is reading a, new, a London newspaper. 
Right, but we don't we don't yeah you know, we don't see that for quite a while. So we're we're guessing. Oh sure, yeah. Oh wait, yeah, we're wondering at this yeah. point. Oh, at this point, yes. yeah. We don't know whether they're we're going thinking, to America or. From hey, America where are these people going? Or, and after we meet the captain, who is being alerted that there are stowaways, and snaps at one of the passengers. Wednesday. Um, yes. <laughs> Yeah. And right here, whenever you have a scene, a little scene like this with the straight cast, but no Marx Brothers, <laughs> you get straight lines without punchlines. <laughs> so I'm an old goat, am I? <laughs> so where exactly are they, they writing these notes, these uh, nasty notes? Are they leaving them <laughs> just out on the deck or are they handing them to somebody and running away? Or, uh, what are they doing exactly? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Okay, so now we we have the, um, the, the the probably the most famous first first glimpse of them in a movie together. They're in their barrels, uh, and we hear them before we see them. And what we hear is Sweet Adeline, and this is obviously an extremely controversial moment. There's been all kinds of disagreement and speculation. Uh, what do we hear? How many voices do we hear? Do we hear three? Do we hear four? And is one of them Harpo? Um, it's it's. I hear five actually. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think one thing I think before we go any further that I, I hope we can all agree on is that the, the line. How do you know there are four of them? Well, they were saying sweet out of line. Is a joke that doesn't help us get anywhere. Um, even if they had it said, no, it's got to be three of us. Harpo doesn't make a sound. And there are only three voices there. I can't imagine anyone around that writer's table saying, oh, oh, we'll have to take that joke out then because there are only three. It's just a joke. It's a funny joke. And it, it gets us nowhere towards the truth. Having said that, we then have this issue. I'd always heard the three voices. Um, Glenn Mitchell, I remember, was very adamantly uh certain that there were four when he was checking the um the, the proof copy of my of my book he said we're going to have to agree to disagree on this one i've heard very strong cases for it being three i, I just wish there was some sort of expert or somebody we could consult who knew about this type of stuff well exactly um i, I have heard a very very uh convincing argument for for there being four which was from andrea orlando in our um facebook group uh so so really the the ideal thing here would be would be to bring her in so hey why don't we do that? Is that possible? Let's try. Let's try. Andrea? <laughs> yeah. Hi there. <laughs> hey, Andrea. It's Andrea Orlando. Wow. How's everybody doing? I'm doing fine. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great here from the south shore of Long Island. So hello, everyone. Now, um, obviously, everyone in the Facebook group knows exactly who you are, and they're all now bouncing up and down in their seats and clapping. Um, if by any chance anybody <laughs> doesn't, just tell us something about your background. You're, you're a musical person well i'm i'm a music teacher that's my uh my day job and uh, i teach chorus i teach singers i mostly teach um developmentally uh challenged students mostly autistic and uh, i also teach a general population of students all teenagers in public school so what i want you to do if it's if it's possible then is to kind of talk us through your your version of what we're hearing because what i like about it is is not only that it that it offers um a solution that that sounds coherent it also points us in a suggestive direction that that implies they're doing something amusing which i can understand them doing well you know the your point about the joke is spot on because that is just a funny joke that there are four voices everyone would assume sweet adelines are four voices and anyone in 1931 would be very familiar with barbershop but um, I watch the movie so much, you know, and my job for 20 years, as I said, is a music teacher. So I, I am doing so much listening all the time. And it wasn't until I had the movie on and I turned and didn't even look at it anymore and just heard the voices that I realized very clearly exactly what was going on. In all my dreams, In all my dreams your fair face be, your fair face be, your be. Now, there isn't too much conjecture. I think pretty much any musician that listens to it only hears three voices going on at once. It's clear that Zeppo is the one that comes in with, in all my dreams. In all my dreams. And then Groucho and Chico come in with, in all my dreams. In all my dreams. In harmony, with Groucho on the top harmony and Chico on the bottom. In the second line, your fair face beams. That's clearly Zeppo again. Your fair face beams. And Groucho 
And then another voice sings your fair face beams with Groucho, but it's not the same voice as Chico. Who it is could be anyone. Uh, We have theories, but I don't know. And then you're the idol of my heart. That's clearly Zeppo again with the background, but Chico comes back in with Groucho. And then Zepp finishes it up with Sweet Adeline. And then um, Chico and Groucho finish the tag of My Adeline. Sweet Adeline. That's exactly what I hear. So the point then, the, the, the important point is that, that, that there's no need for that extra voice. There's no reason why it would be there unless... It was a joke, unless it was Harpo kind of sneaking himself in. It's it's not it's not like suddenly Chico couldn't do it or something. Oh, absolutely, and and how brilliant! <laughs> that's why I love them so much because if that's true, and um, he really did sneak his voice in. I mean, what a clever way to do it. The other thing is, if it was barbershop and four parts, the voice that's missing is bass part. And clearly there is no bass voice in here. It's a baritone, which is Chico, and a tenor, which is Groucho. And then Zeppo is singing the lead baritone. There is no bass voice. So that's why I'm saying that's why I'm saying it's only three voices at a time. It's just my conjecture is who the three voices are. That's the question. So the other nice thing about this then, the third nice thing about it, is it sort of makes everyone right. Um there there are there are there are three vocal lines. Mm-hmm. But there's a hidden fourth voice. So so kind of the people who think, say I can only hear three, they're, they're kind of right. They just haven't quite mm-hmm. picked up this extra voice. So remind me again, where, where does, which line does that, does that new voice come in on? Zeppo will come in with the second line, your fair face beams. And then Groucho is singing with someone else. Someone your else. fair face beams. Yeah. Someone, yes, someone else is singing Chico's part there. It is not the same voice quality accent. Anything is not the same. That's that's good. I like that because it it not only makes sense of a of a mystery, it also tells us something about how they were operating at that time. Because we know that that the film is full of in jokes and it's full of clever little touches that we're not supposed to spot particularly. And it just makes right. perfect sense for me that that would be another one of those. There has been um, some people who think that it's Chico that sings the first opening line, the lead. I must admit, I always used to. Yeah, really. I can't imagine how anybody could think that, but I, I've seen it. I've, I've seen somebody notate it, but I, I don't think, um, I really don't think that's the case. I think we know enough about Zeppo's voice and we've heard him sing that very brash quality with all the vibrato. Chico uh-huh. doesn't have vibrato in his voice at all. Uh, see, this is the stuff I so, don't know anything yeah, the person, about. The person who claimed that, he was too scared to come on with you. So, so <laughs> oh, I guess, he, oh, we're going to give this one to you. Andrea. But he definitely shouldn't be scared because he did notate it in G major and his parts are correct. And it makes total sense. To- and I wouldn't want anyone to ever feel He's nervous about scared. talking about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, my Mr. God. Mr. Gazelle. Just to, we, know enough, we know enough about Zeppo's voice. Like we've heard him sing out. Even the Chevalier scene when he sings, uh, he sings out like that. We hear he has a very quick very rapid vibrato sound, whereas Chico doesn't have that at all. Well, Zeppo obviously is your is your specialist subject. Um, before yeah. we let you go, obviously this is a key film for Zeppo fans. It's it's probably his biggest opportunity to make something of himself as both as a Marx brother and as a as a as a an actor, really. Um, does he oh, yeah. does he make the grade? Ah, oh, well. If you like watching someone be completely awkward and self conscious, <laughs> then yeah. He does. What I love about it is finally they found a good vehicle for him. Like they found a, no, I'm not going to say character because that's honestly giving the actor way too much credit. Zeppo never develops a character in this at all. But at least he has a written part that actually gives him something that's interesting to see. It, it's part of the story. He's almost equal to the brothers around him, which he could never be like, obviously as talented or funny as they are. But, um, you know, he has no chemistry with Ruth Hall. That's kind of obvious, I think. That's just because mm. he's a bad actor. He, I mean, he didn't even show chemistry with Thelma Todd, and she was just absolutely amazing with everybody on film. But I'm disappointed that Zeppo couldn't do more with what he was given. But that we have it to look at, I think, is just amazing. I just, you know, I love it. I was watching again today, and I was struck by how sketchy what he's given is. I mean, we have that little sort of cute scene where they meet with the handkerchiefs. And then the next time you see them, mm-hmm. they're sort of 
betrothed, aren't they? And then there's this whole the, the courtship is missing. So in a way, he really hasn't got a chance to do to to build up a rapport with her. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? He throws those lines away uh, after the the handkerchief is dropped, and then you know, is this yours? Yes, it is. Like he says it with absolutely like nothing behind it. So, I mean, do we really want to see him develop the romance? Well, with maybe her? Not, I don't yeah. know that it would go anywhere. You know, the trees. Yeah. Oh, you bet your life. I love them. That bit's so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, even in the cabin scene, when he's in the cabin with uh, Groucho and uh, Alki, he's wringing his hands, but he's not really supposed to be doing that. He He doesn't have a defined like person that's in his head. He's just, it's so it's such shallow amateurish acting, but I think it's just so charming because the people around him are so amazing. Even it the supporting endearing. cast, the the supporting cast around him is amazing, and the brothers are just. I mean, Chico is like one of the most talented. My God, they're just all amazing. So it makes him look ten times worse. But I think that's the charm about him. If if if, if Chico or Harpo or Groucho had to play basically themselves without their character, they might not have been done much better. So right. But I think this this was an opportunity. Like, look at the attitude, like how the how brash uh, Zeppo is when he does the uh, presenting of his passport. He's like, yeah, that's me. He doesn't even do a French accent or anything. He's like, yeah, that's, that's my passport. <laughs> if he had that character and brought that into the party scene when um, the Ruth Hall character gets kidnapped, I mean, that I would have died to see something like that. But he's just so dead when we get to that part. He's so dead. The other thing he gets to do, of course, is fight at the end, and for for a well known uh, a well known pugilist, uh, mm-hmm. he, he makes he makes a somewhat theatrical job of that too, doesn't he? <laughs> My point exactly, like he's supposed to be a fighter in real life, and you know I know how intense he was supposed to be from what people have written about him in his private life, and he's just flailing his arms around. It's <laughs> it's very weak. He's not you know centered at all when he's throwing his you know quote unquote punches. It's it's all over the place. It really is. <laughs> what a shame. I still love watching it. Don't get me wrong. But I agree with a lot of people that say that that's kind of a weak ending for that movie. Andrew, it's been a, it's been a joy talking to you. It's been ridiculously short. We will have you back. We want to know more about Zeppo, particularly when we get to horse feathers. But any other excuse we can think of, we will, we will get you back. In the meantime, thank you very much for joining us. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you, Awesome. Andrea. Thank you so much. No, you could come back now. <laughs> She's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. You guys are terrible. Yes. Well, as we have said, I, I find myself unable to commit to a theory on, on exactly who is singing in, in that opening and whether Harpo's there or not. But I'm fully prepared to commit to the conviction that this is – I think the best entrance the Marx Brothers have ever had on film, um, that sort of almost aggressive zoom into those four barrels, mm-hmm. the fact that they, while um, allegedly hiding from the authorities on the ship, are singing from inside those barrels is wonderful. The fact that they seem to have an entire you know home inside each of those barrels. <laughs> They don't even notice when uh, the barrels are lifted up. Mm. They're in there kind of cooking breakfast. Yeah. They I don't think seem Gr- to. Groucho is smoking in the barrel, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they bow for it's applause when they come out. Don't yes. They? Yeah, it must have been quite nice to see in the theater with the audience yeah. reacting. I, I bet they yeah, got that you think applause. audiences yeah. applauded? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I hope so. And it almost makes me wish I could see it on stage. Imagine a curtain opening on those four mm, barrels. Mm, <laughs> you know, it's 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 a beautiful beginning. The, um, and the kippered herring um, being what's stamped on those barrels also suggests, first of all, a little taste of the brothers' Jewish roots. Mm-hmm. And it reminds us of that line that we've been told about from... Home again and Mr. Green's reception. Uh, you know, this must be the far Rockaway boat. I can smell the herring. Uh, <laughs> so it connects to their earlier work in a way. It's just a, I don't know, I can't imagine a better entrance for them. And it's an entrance only made possible by the fact that this film, as we've pointed out, casts them a little differently than usual. Mm-hmm. Knowing each other at the outset and um, not introducing Groucho as part of the establishment and Chico and Harpo as interlopers. So then we get a little banter. And as a throwaway line, we get the little nugget that Groucho has a wife and kids. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that apparently he's abandoning? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> to find a better life, yeah. He refers to his wife later, too, in his scene on the porch with Thelma Todd. 
Uh, and Chico's grandfather, of course, who is, in a sense, the main character of this story, is <laughs> introduced uh, in this scene as well. There is just that one oddity, which I'll just very quickly mention. This is, a, a, again, a, another thing that George Bettinger pointed out to me. There's a strange moment when they're looking for them. Uh, there are two sailors who are stood together and then the captain, not the captain, but, you know, the authority figure comes down and says, you'll never you'll never find them standing around this way. And they very quickly do something. One of them puts something in down the front of his shirt, and the, the, all I can oh, think of is that they're sw- they're swapping cigarettes. But it's so um, it's done so subliminally; it's cut down to like half a shot. Anyway, I, I'm quiet. Carry on. <laughs> and, and then the barrels are raised, and uh, we see the Marxes. The, what are they? I don't know if they're doing dishes. They're, they're <laughs> they seem unfazed by the fact that they're now exposed and. Uh, when I was a kid, I thought they were all doing the same thing. When it when it lifted up, I thought that was a joke, and they were they were all playing like a game, like jacks or something, playing like a little ball game, scrambling eggs or something. Yeah. <laughs> Groucho seems to be brushing his teeth at some point, yes. and and the captain, and uh, not the captain, but the first mate, Tom Kennedy, has uh, has barked this order to his crew. You know, get these barrels out of here. You know, we're looking for four stowaways. Get these four man-sized <laughs> barrels out of the way so we can find them. Yeah, those are the only things on the uh, in the scene where they could possibly be. Yeah. Case, and, yeah, and where are they taking them? You know, get them out of the way. Get them out of the hold. We're in the middle of the ocean, but get these barrels out of the hold. <laughs> so they're discovered, and we're off to the races. We're off to the movies, finally. Yeah. As the Marxists actually <laughs> run, and the, and the camera follows them, running Yeah. Through, yeah, we're in a movie. They're at, they're at the movies. Yeah, tracking shots. This must have been so novel in 1931 to just see this instantly. Yeah, right. Like the cat's out of the bag, and we're running all over the deck of this ship. It's full of energy, and um, and although yes, we all lean toward the stage over the cinema. Um, they found this kind of analogy, I think, for what it must have felt like to see them on stage in the sheer manic energy of this mm. sequence. And then, of course, we come to the great moment where they grab the instruments and play a little tune. And then there's a wonderful applause that comes out of nowhere, and they're off to the races again. (laughs) And then they, uh, <laughs> I love this moment where they see this woman asleep on a on a deck chair, and then we cut to the crew running after them. And they approach the deck chair, and we see Groucho is hidden under a little blanket, but Harpo's nowhere to be seen. But then the woman screams, and she gets up, and Harpo is underneath, and beneath him is another guy. It's one thing for Harpo to get underneath there, but how did the guy, the other guy, get underneath? <laughs> and how did this woman not know that there were two men sitting <laughs> under her? <laughs> I mean, it establishes right away that we are a few shades more uh, surreal than coconuts and animal crackers. Um, that this this woman is absolutely startled to discover that yes. she is seated on top of two men, <laughs> and it cheats. You know, that's something I said in my book is that you know the film does cheat if it's if it's funny to do that then they'll do that if it's funny for uh, a, a bloke uh, taking a photograph uh to to, to have, for it to be revealed that it's harpo underneath you know and there is no camera there they'll do that but then when the time comes to get off the boat uh, they the, you know the, their magic powers have gone and their impersonation of chevaliers are, are chevaliers poor so it, it it does cheat in that way but it just doesn't matter because it's, you know, it's a bit like, um, you know, it's the difference between an airplane and a, and a Mel Brooks film, isn't it? It's uh, mm-hmm. it, it just yeah. all, all that matters is the jokes. Yeah, they like they are superheroes and comedy is their superpower. They are as powerful <laughs> as the comic potential of the situation they're in. And then we got Groucho uh, sliding down a banister and encountering the captain and some women. Yes. And... <laughs> He pegs him as a stowaway pretty easily. I don't know. He says, "What are you look more like a stowaway?" Yes, I mean, he just looks like a. Bl- and Groucho throws him a few insults, and the captain's ready to put him put him in irons. Mm. <laughs> yeah, this world is completely unprepared to deal with Groucho. We get a little preview of Thelma Todd here, where he 
Crutch that says, I want, to, I want some hot cha cha. I want some gaiety. He does a little dance. I'm young. I want gaiety, laughter, hot cha cha. I want to dance. I want to dance till the cows come home. Oh. What do you mean by this? And then Chico appears, and then we get to the scene where Chico and Groucho are, are in the, what's it called, the chart room? Yeah. <laughs> this is interesting. This is a, a Groucho Chico encounter that doesn't really get a, a lot of notice because, you know, there's a lot of funny lines here, but there's no real point or premise to it you could they're basically just yes BSing. they're basically just talking to each other it's built on the same idea isn't it i mean groucho sort of does a token sort of you know he grabs his hair and he says there was the nurse taking care of me and all that but it, it hasn't it doesn't have the build of the earlier scenes with them so it's it's more of a again it's much quicker much 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 more of a kind of a fast paced piece rather than a rather than a comedy sketch that then that then starts isn't it mm-hmm one thing about that, that that I think is interesting is uh, when we think about this film being a whole new venture for them uh, because it's it's their first Hollywood movie and it's not something that they've had any experience of playing before an audience as their previous two films were and perfecting in that way. And then in 1935, obviously, uh, we're told that Thalberg kind of reintroduces that idea by giving them uh, a stage tryout. Uh, what I've noticed from looking at the early draft scripts is that they're they're very very different from the film we have in an interesting way all of the other characters uh the non marx characters their their dialogue in those early drafts reads like a transcript of the film but the marx lines about one in 20 is, is the same so so somehow they were still doing it my guess is that they were using the crew as their audience and every time they rehearsed they would they would perfect and change so some lines are totally different but there are also lines that are you know basically the same joke but they've been improved and there's a good one here where chico says uh, his father was partners with columbus and groucho says how's that possible you know it's hundreds of years before uh, and he says, well, they, they, they told me he was my father, which is a wonderfully nonsensical line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Originally, it was just that's why they split up. Um, and later on, uh, when Groucho goes into Thelma's closet, what are you doing in there? Nothing. Come on in. Was originally nothing, but it's not a bad idea. So they clearly are working on these lines and trying them out just as they did on stage. So I can only assume that they're using the crew and every time the crew stops laughing, they're rewriting them. But the, the differences are enormous. If you go through these draft scripts, that's an excellent point. And it also is, it really is true that uh, we always, you know, we love the first two films based on the shows they'd done on Broadway hundreds of times. And we always talk about Thalberg's brilliance and, and having them test material on the road. But the three films in the middle that they never did on stage in any way, uh, they aren't, uh, they aren't worse. You know, they don't have uh, fewer good laughs in them. Which does seem to um, contradict the idea that this stuff absolutely had to be worked out in front of an audience, uh, unless it's just that what audience they had on the set, as you suggest, Matthew, was enough. Mm. So now we get to the part where Chico and Groucho come near the captain's lunch, and not only do they <laughs> eat his lunch, they eat it in front of him. Yeah. <laughs> they, they go in the room and start eating in front of him, and he's flabbergasted, and so it's talking about how one of the stowaways goes around with a black mustache. One of them goes around with a black mustache. So do I. If I had my choice, I'd go around with a little blonde. I, I guess the writers had two punchlines. They didn't know which one to use because he gives them the same setup line again. I said one goes around with a black mustache. Well, you couldn't expect a mustache to go around by itself. Don't you think a mustache ever gets lonely, Captain? Yeah, and demands that the captain give Chico his chair. <laughs> and uh, and even up to the moment when they've been discovered and it's time to, you know, cut and run, um, they're still, I love Chico's, don't forget the butter, urgently <laughs> yes. shouted to Groucho yeah. <laughs> as they're <laughs> fleeing the room. <laughs> and also the fact that the first mate is always adjusting his glasses whenever he sees something that <laughs> yeah. isn't what it should be. He always just puts his fingers on his glasses and moves them a little bit as though that will take care of this problem. And I think he just needs new glasses. That's my Apparently that's my so. <laughs> and then we have a great little cutaway gag, which was my favorite moment as a kid watching the film, and that's Harpo. And, and, and standing and there the in the front, women's room. In, oh, is that what it was? Yeah, in front of the women's room. And uh guy goes in, gets kicked out. Uh, <laughs> I was I'm wondering why we don't hear a little lady scream in there, but uh, 
I'm afraid I'd already seen Benny Hill do that by the time I uh, <laughs> by the time I got to the Marx Brothers. <laughs> and now we come to the romantic side of the film, where yes. Zeppo running around the deck uh, in his haste to uh, blend in the crowd, grabs the uh, side of a young lady walking down the deck. Uh, actress Ruth Hall. Ruth Hall is nice. I, when I'm watching, I keep thinking, oh, man, too bad they couldn't get Lillian Roth back to do this. That would have been yeah. nice to see Lillian back. I have mean, nothing against Ruth, but she does fine. And uh, they, have an, they have a cute little banter there and a little <laughs> chemistry. And yep. uh, and he steals her handkerchief um, in their little flirting tactic, which which does uh, – he does get some uh, Marx brother cred here for, on one hand, he's flirting with this girl – he has the responsibility of the love story in this movie. Uh, but the chance to pick up a handkerchief for free is nevertheless irresistible to him. <laughs> and the way he says, yes, it is, when she asks if it's his, <laughs> is, uh, it's worthy of the family. And it's funny how Zeppo, um, actually when um, Ellen Jones and the uh, other uh, pieces of meat came around later to, t- to <laughs> be romantically to the film... How how it was often stated that they were taking you know Zeppo's places the romantic lead, and this is really the only film where he does that. The mm. you know he's he's romancing Thelma Todd and Horse Feathers, but that's more of a plot device, and they're you know that's it's not really a romance. It's just sort of a plot device to get her into the film, and all the brothers are actually going yeah. His there. romance is is cut, isn't it? It's the girl that sat on his lap when he says hello, old timer. She was originally in it a lot more, I think. Oh yeah. So yeah, this is his one chance to be to be the uh, the matinee idol, and boy does he does he grab that chance. <laughs> <laughs> it's a romance for the ages. <laughs> his awkward line readings are just so they're so attention grabbing. I don't I don't know how to put it. I just, I'm like, how is he going to read this line? Yeah, <laughs> you're never bored. That's true. <laughs> yeah. That's a weird word to emphasize. <laughs> Anyhow, let's move on to the adventures of Harpo and the Punch and Judy puppet show. Yes. Yes. Now, this, I must say, is my duck soup moment, because okay. um, a little while back, uh, when we were talking about, in one of our earlier shows, uh, the, the things we, we didn't like so much, Noah uh, nominated this as one of his least favorite moments and i remember thinking yeah. oh re- you know really oh you know but, um, <laughs> and then and then i realized that this you know this was my duck soup moment whenever anybody um contacts me out of the blue and and says they like my book which doesn't happen very often but but when they do they always talk about duck soup and they either say i liked your book but you're wrong about duck soup or they say i, I watched duck soup again and i i see what you're saying and the the point is that we we, we tend to believe what we're told if enough people are telling us the same thing and i've you know i've never really put this forward as a great scene or a favorite scene but i've never questioned that it was one of their you know one of their kind of key scenes and then when i watched it again this time with noah's words kind of in the back of my head i thought yeah actually this is this isn't really all that great it's it mixes (laughs) kind of very broad slapstick with a, a degree of sentiment um and and it's actually not what i thought it was um w- what it is ideal for is a harpo movie but it doesn't really fit in this film if if it was in love happy it would be great if love happy was full of stuff like mm. this then love happy would be a a superb harpo movie but i don't think it has the bite that this movie demands yeah i it doesn't do it for me and and it's not that i despise the sequence. I, I don't hate it. But for me, it has a couple of good gags in it, but it's not nearly um, funny or of the essence enough to justify how uh, noisy and grating it is. Mm. The, I- the idea of Harpo with children is is seems to be full of potential. Um, but I don't know. Harpo is a child. Um, and so giving him this audience of children... Um, I don't know. It, it doesn't necessarily feel like an idea that had to fail, but I think it it pretty much does here. Yeah. Um, and since it's not a case of uh, Harpo's um, maniacal energy disrupting, you know, staid propriety, um, you know, the only backdrop he has to play against here um, for most of it is this group of boisterous children. Uh, Harpo almost gets lost in the sequence. Let me interject here. By this time, they had pretty much perfected audio dubbing and they dubbed in a lot of kids screaming and yelping <laughs> on, this, on this scene uh-huh. there's a lot more yelping than there are kids 
Yes. If it were hilarious, I wouldn't. I wouldn't wonder about like where is the puppeteer. Mm. That's the kind of thing we we don't care about when the Marx Brothers are are firing on all cylinders. But um, under these circumstances, I do think. Well, wait a minute. What what's really going on here? And by uh, the way, we get our first uh, exposure to someone beating the crap out of Harpo in the scene. But it, yes, it's played a lot differently yes. here than it yeah. than later on. The thing that really struck me this time is when Tom Kennedy gets in there. I mean, all he all he wants to do is apprehend a stowaway. What he actually does is throttle him for about 15 seconds. He just he's strangling him and shaking his head for a really long time. <laughs> what is he doing? Yeah, and sticking him in the ass with a pin. I think that's in the guidebook for what you do to stowaways. With <laughs> for your continuity buffs out there, we get the uh, we see the captain come in apparently with his daughter or with a young girl. But mm-hmm. in the shot previous to that, we see that same girl in the front row, uh, uh, and already enjoying the show. So may- maybe, uh, maybe it's her twin sister. I don't know. Could be yeah. twins. Yeah. <laughs> maybe they're from Canada. <laughs> so the kids, the kids enjoy the show, and Harpo makes a nice little escape on a little cycle. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that is nice. Yeah. His his retreat from this scene is is nicely done, and he signals his turn, and it just happens. That's nice. And now we cut away to Chico with. A manicurist. Do we know her name? Do we know her? <laughs> I don't know, but she's got it. She's got it. <laughs> hey, you're a nice looking gal, all right. You got it. Thank you. And you can keep it. Chico responds with with a Groucho type of uh, mm. insult to her. Yes. You know, very Groucho. Normally, yes. Chico would be hitting on the girl. He, he mm. wouldn't be turning her off. How about mustard's no good without roast beef? <laughs> the uh, the idea that, all right, if these stowaways, they are penniless, they are starving. He's got two pieces of bread in his pocket <laughs> with mustard on them. But the lack of roast beef makes it not even worth eating. <laughs> it's not a laugh out loud joke in the movie, but it as a, a taking another uh, uh, Jenga stick out of our tower of logic. Well, uh, maybe that's why he was so hungry. Not that he didn't have anything to eat. This is that he didn't care for any of the... Food. There was, he has ludicrously yeah, high standards. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, what I want to call attention to is when the the crew member comes in asking for a once over. Uh, Chico's terrifying <laughs> comment: "We take care of you, all right." <laughs> That's what you want to hear when you sit down in the barber's chair. And then he has to has to be woken up, and he falls asleep within about twelve seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, you know, I'm sure everybody knows they sit there and eventually clip off the entire mustache. But I, there's a still that I've come across, and I'm going to try and find it and post it uh, on our blog. And then with the barber chair elevated about 15 feet in the air. So there were yeah. there was another version of the scene, and I've read yeah. that Nat Perrin was a little upset that the, some stuff that he wrote for the barbershop scene was cut out. So perhaps And the original... Was- the original yes. barber, the first barber that then leaves is Rolf Sedan, who's a, you know, who's who's not chopped liver, and a lot of the uh, original reviews make a big deal of the fact that he's in it. So obviously there was more going on there. Uh, we also have Billy Barty, don't we, and Harpo in a nurse's uniform. So uh, quite a bit is missing around here, and I think that's because the Punch and Judy scene swelled so much. Yeah, you know, as was brought up earlier, the fact that these three films, Monkey Business, Horse Feathers, and Duck Soup, weren't done in front of an audience, that it looks like they do have a tremendous amount of stuff that we see stills for that was cut out. Especially around Harpo, because as as we know, yes. you know he, he wasn't really scripted. He was given ideas, which were then worked on. And if they worked, they, they expanded. This guy apparently grows his mustache. It's only really growing from the middle. Yes. <laughs> and he just grows, grows it really long and combs it out in both He directions. must shave. Yes, he must shave underneath that, that long piece. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and I don't know. I mean, the, the, the rules of what a mustache is or isn't in these films are highly complex. What if Groucho were sitting in that chair? What could they possibly do for him? <laughs> And there's one little interesting moment. Uh, when Harpo is going over to uh, sharpen his blade, Chico starts talking about the food. Hey, you know, I'm never going onto this boat again. The food is no good. Of course, I know each yet. But even if I don't eat, I like the food good. Yes, it's overdubbed, isn't it? It sounds like they didn't want Harpo just there with no sound, so they grabbed some audio from s- some other scene and just mm. laid, laid it in there. Because it really is no uh, continuity to what Chico yeah. was saying before or after. Something about the way Harpo cuts that 
it's like a piece of balsa wood or something. To, <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. It's not really a gag, but I I love the way he does that. <laughs> yeah, it's menace and and amusement combined, isn't it? Which is when he's always at his best. Yeah. And, and there's a kind of proficiency to it also. Like these guys, for one reason or another, are capable of, you know, marching into a barber shop and mm. sort of running the place. So now it's time we meet our favorite couple, the Briggs, uh, Alki and Lucille. <laughs> Uh, who, who do we got playing Alki Briggs here? We got... Uh... Uh, you're me tapping away here. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Siri, who played Alki Briggs? Harry Woods. Harry Woods. I couldn't find who played Alki Briggs in your music. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Woods in an Oscar bait performance, yeah. <laughs> I love this stuff, the hard-boiled dialogue between them. And um, although it's, it's, and they had a good writing team for this. I mean, it's tempting to attribute it to John Stone, who wrote a lot of hard-boiled gangster talk in I'll Say She Is and elsewhere. But of course, Perelman, too, was no slouch when it came to parodying the talk of, of B movies and the sort of Damon Runyon esque character. Now, listen to me, Mr. Alfie Briggs. You can't keep me cooked up like this. I've played second fiddle on this ship long enough. Now, you listen. I'm not after any dames. I'm after Joe Helton, I tell you. And he can't get away from me on this boat. He's going to put his okay on my gang, or he's going to get this. So is he, he ever locked in the room or something? I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, she's been cooped up, but I guess he won't let her <laughs> run free. Who knows? Women. And Groucho somehow convinces both the first mate and the Briggs that he's a tailor as he dashes into the room and into the closet. And the <laughs> yeah, the Briggs uh, finish their argument. Then <laughs> yeah, they don't. They just don't even look at him. <laughs> I tell you something. I want to know before we even get to Groucho playing that guitar. Whose is it? Is it Alki mm. or is it Lucille that likes to play the guitar in bed? <laughs> Well, it seems like she's been locked in the room for the so it's hers. trip. So it must be, yes. It's her guitar. <laughs> okay. So she's the one who sits in bed strumming the guitar. Okay. <laughs> so Alki storms out, and Lucille uh, is upset, and all of a sudden it dawns on her that this tailor has disappeared into the closet. And <laughs> he charms her, and she's, she's intrigued. She, she you know, sort of gets he's... him straight away, yeah. you know, which yeah. is good, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And she so opens she's... up to him, and we get the hot cha cha stuff. I want excitement. I want a hot cha cha cha. Did either of you notice how the guitar appears and disappears? No. It's very strange. Uh, it's not there when he says, I rest my case and gets into bed. And then when he says, you're not going to get me out of this bed, it's there. When he says, you're a woman who's been getting nothing but dirty breaks, it's gone. When he says, we can clean and tighten your breaks, it's back. So God knows how that scene was shot. <laughs> I can picture Irving Thalberg watching this, like shaking his head, like, God, <laughs> what are these guys doing? <laughs> I've got to take these boys in hand. <laughs> and then Elkie comes back in, and we, you know, he's spouting the gangster code book to him, and Groucho's not phased and gives it right back. And like, yeah. like Lucille, Elkie is eventually taken by his charms. And What do you think about Groucho's cutesy stuff here? Is there anything you've got to say before I drill you? Yes, I'd like to ask you one question. Go ahead. Do you think that girls think less of a boy if he lets himself be kissed? I mean, uh, don't you think that although girls go out with boys like me, they, they always marry the other kind? Some people don't like that. I do. But some people think that that's not what Groucho should be up to. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it, I like it. Um, and I find this to be a fantastic performance from Groucho. But it is true. I mean, we, we don't like it when he's manic and, and cutesy in some of the later MGMs. Here, you could argue it's a little bit of the same technique, but it doesn't come off that way. It comes off as a grown man feigning childishness because of the ridiculousness of the situation. I agree, yeah. It is also worth noting, although, yeah, Groucho is definitely, um, as you put it in your book, Matthew, a dervish here. He's just full of um, energy and voices and and little bits um he is still as always stiller and quieter than we might remember him he does lots of unexpected things with his voice and with his body but very rarely pulls any of this what we think of as the standard groucho moves yes um out 
there's very little of it. Um, in fact, only twice in this movie does he even sort of wiggle his eyebrows. He does it a little bit on, on I'm spying on you. <laughs> um, and then uh, again later at the party. But it's remarkable how inventive he is. And in our memories and sometimes in our imitations, he, he gets boiled down to just a few signature moves. But we rarely see them. They all surprise us here. I think they're they're at their Hollywood best, actually. They they Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Zeppel makes his way into the room and Does he? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I never noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does. And Elke hires the two of them to be his guards as he's going to confront uh, Joe Helton. And he hands them both guns, which they promptly ditch into a barrel of water. Yes, we Fuck. had to drown the guns. <laughs> I think there's something about the idea that these underworld characters, um, they can communicate with the Marx Brothers. Like, they can get along. And when Groucho mouths off to Alki Briggs, his response is, hey, you know, I could use a guy with your kind of nerve. <laughs> Which, you know, the director of an opera company or something would never have that reaction to him. Um, but the Marx Brothers are kind of comfortable in the, this world of gangsters and, and underworld characters. Which leads me to a sideline, actually. Um, as we know, um, there was plans to re-release monkey business in the code era which were abandoned and they re-released horse feathers instead and uh we now have a kind of a slightly uh abbreviated horse feathers for that reason we have a a, a relatively or completely unabbreviated monkey business for the same reason because they didn't and i think once we get to joe helton I think that's the reason because what we're actually looking at here is a, is a remarkably a moral story gangsters in the code era are obviously um can only exist as villains who who are defeated and in fact even in in the pre-code era in scarface and little caesar and public enemy there was a tremendous pressure to uh to moderate these films because they were felt to be glamorizing gangsters and and uh, uh you know encouraging violent crime although joe is shown to be sort of a repentant He's not I repentant. Hear that, though. I don't think he's repentant. But it says it in the newspaper that he's going to live a, a no. He's retiring. A clean, a clean life. He's retiring. He's not repentant. Retiring just, from being a bad guy. Yeah, he's just <laughs> he's just giving it up. He's made enough money and he's giving it up. And I think there's nothing you can do to change that. There are no little cuts you can make to mm -hmm. to alter that. What we're looking at are two rival gangsters, and there's really nothing to choose between them except that Joe Helton is more urbane. And um, and I think that's... They never that, use the word gangster in the film. They say racketeer. I think, exactly, yeah. I think that some changes... I think some changes were made right at the time for that reason. I mean, obviously, as we know, the film was originally going to be called Pineapples, which is why in the House That Shadows Built sequence, Zeppo says, yeah. you know, this is not pineapples, nor is it you know, not monkey business, nor is it pineapples, because that refers to a hand grenade. Um, in the early scripts, Joe Helton is called Joe Farina, which is a much more gangstery name. And also, um, he's a much more unpleasant character. He's as, he's as rude to the Marx Brothers and as kind of menacing to them as Alki is. And, uh, the, the climax, rather than in this kind of anonymous old barn, was originally set in a, in a, in a waterfront warehouse where Alki Briggs is masterminding his bootlegging operation. So there is already, it, from, from script to production, there's a change to kind of moderate these gangster influences. But ultimately, Joe, Joe Helton is a, is a gangster. And there's very, apart from the fact that he's got a, a very sweet daughter that Zeppo falls for, and the fact that he's retiring, there's not much to choose between him and Alki. And I think that uh, is why it was considered not, not re-releasable. The daughter does kind of make Helton slightly more of a good guy. I mean, he, he also seems less savage and, and vicious than, than uh, Alki Briggs. And particularly Alki Briggs, when he sees Mary and he says, hey, say, she's kind of cute, isn't she? And, <laughs> and Helton, you know, redirects his gaze. Hey, hey, uh, hey. You know, yeah, watch it there. <laughs> um, yeah, well, after Zeppo and, and Groucho and the lovely Briggs couple have their scene, we get Harpo uh, running along the deck and he comes to this fountain and he acquires this frog who leaps into his hat. Um, and this will be Harpo's soulmate for the rest of the picture. 
what are we looking at there? Are we looking at a at a fake frog that somehow has been is it on strings or did they or did they get an actual frog to jump? It, it's really good. It's hard to say. It, it looks totally lifeless. You cannot train a frog. So what? How did they do that? <laughs> Maybe they jumped out of the hat and they reversed the film <laughs> backwards. Ah. <laughs> Maybe this is Jim Smiley's jumping frog of Calaveras <laughs> County. It's really good, but you know, I, I've, I'm sure you cannot train a frog, so it must be a fake frog. But it's really good. Didn't want a special effects award, I think. <laughs> Maybe this frog could eat the butterfly that Harpo will fight in. <laughs> <Anita Power. laughs> Uh, then he finds himself uh, on on this deck playing chess. Uh, guys are playing chess and and demanding silence. And Harpo and Chico sort of become a parody of the whole idea of wanting to play chess in silence. You know, when they're sitting, when Harpo is first sitting there watching the game, I'm reminded of the scene that comes up in, uh, in Horse Feathers when he's watching the guys play cards. Yeah, and also in in the Pharmacist, the W. C. Fields film, where he he kind of butts in on a chess game and makes various elaborate gestures to 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 stop the uh, the players making the moves they want to make. It's very reminiscent of that. So Chico and Harpo commandeer the chessboard and take off with it, much to the chagrin of the two old gents uh, who are left flustered. Now we cut to Joe Helton's suite, where he is greeted by his lovely daughter who we learn is the woman that uh, Zeppo has been romancing. seems like he's given up his nasty ways and wants to just come home and have a nice life with his daughter. Anyhow, Elke comes in uh, ready to confront Joe and Joe is having none of this and they get into a heated argument that's getting quite nasty and right in the middle of it, Chico and Harpo come bursting through the door. Well, before we get to that, we see them in the hallway coming towards the suite and we hear dogs barking. I'm not really sure why there are dogs barking. There's no setup or punchline or explanation. There's just dogs barking. And they go into the suite with Elke and Joe, who are having a heated argument. They barely notice them. And uh, it gets to a point where Elke's ready to shoot Joe. Harpo is so upset that this is disturbing his chess game that right as Elke pulls the gun, Harpo clobbers him over the head with the bulb horn and knocks him out. I didn't realize it was that powerful. And like Alki Briggs before him, Joe Helton reasons that uh, these these Marx brothers might be useful yeah. to him. <laughs> this man with a wide experience of the underworld. <laughs> yeah. And at the prospect of earning a little money, Chico especially becomes immediately so eager to please, you know, to show <laughs> off how tough they are. And it's very much like what we'll get in Horse Feathers, you know, get tough with this one, get tough with the other one. Yeah. And there's a lovely line that's very reminiscent of the um, animal cracker scene of uh, how much they get paid to play, how much they get paid to rehearse. If he's paid too much, he's too much tough. <laughs> too much tough, <laughs> yeah. And Joe is so satisfied that he uh, finally feels safe enough to go take a walk on the deck with the, <laughs> with the wife protector. For the first time on the voyage, yeah. he's safe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets everything he deserves when Chico and Harpo lose track of him almost immediately. <laughs> Assaulting a man with a beard uh, who they assume must be, for some reason, Joe Helton in disguise. Uh, I love Chico's knowing, uh, take off the whiskers, we know you. <laughs> and all the other passengers fleeing when they see those guns as well, as they're walking along. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then we know we see, next we see... Uh, Lucille telling Elf Alki, saying she's had it. She wants out. You're going to stay down there like I told you and keep out of my business. Do you understand? Keep yep. out of my business. Your turn. Oh, you are going to show me a good time. A good time. Well, I might as well have stayed home and played solitaire. Your turn. Pipe down, will you? I have more important things than you to worry about. Your turn. You stay down and get a mean, I'll scratch your eyes out. Your turn. Groucho as marriage counselor telling them when to talk. <laughs> yes, with a with a, a flub, isn't there? He says it too early at yeah. one point. Yeah, it's nice that they kept that mm. in it. It makes it feel like you are watching a semi-improvisational yeah. thing. Yeah, his first your turn. He comes in too early. And now we got Groucho approaching Joe Helton and convinces him that he needs a couple more bodyguards. Now, there are two fellas trying to attack you, aren't there? And there are two fellas trying to defend you. Now, why? that's 50% waste. Now, why can't you be attacked by your own bodyguards? Your life will be saved, and that's uh, that's 100% waste. Now, what do you got? You still got me, and I'll attack you for nothing. Now, what do you say? I'll tell you what I say. I say... All right, then it's all settled. I'm to be your new bodyguard. In case I'm going to attack you, I'll have to be there to defend you, too. Now, let me know when you want to be attacked, and I'll be there 10 minutes later to defend you. 
I've already got two bodyguards, but uh, I'll think it over. And after a cute scene with Harpo in the barbershop and the frog and a guy with a frog in his throat, we are finally arriving at our destination, a stock shot of New York City. Beautiful shot. Mm. The Sydney Morning Herald said uh, there's a fine picture of the New York waterfront as the ship arrives at her destination. That was one of the highlights of the film in Australia. <laughs> Mm-hmm. People came out of the movie saying, did you see that fine <laughs> picture of the New York water? God, that was good. Uh, Norman McLeod, wow. <laughs> yeah, boy, he sure can <laughs> drop in a shot of a New York water. <laughs> and now we're back on the deck and we see the passengers getting ready to deboard. And we're, we're introduced to one Madame Frenchy, who apparently is a opera star who is uh, coming to tour. Yes, who is Madame Swemsky in the script, but they they change it to Madame Frenchy. Very, very typical of the spirit of the whole film, I think. And this is one of two characters where people might have said, hmm, I wonder why Margaret Dumas isn't playing this role, but it could have been her. I'm not even sure whether Maggie had come out to California yet. Yes, I think not. Noah would know more than me but i think she was still, she was still in new york wasn't she i don't know for sure but i i would think so yeah i mean i think at this point the marx brothers too were you know they thought of themselves as stage actors broadway stars who were trying this this other thing and exactly yeah happened. but mm-hmm. yeah, it was only an experiment yeah. wasn't it and we have this great moment now where harpo is apparently turned into a camera under the, <laughs> under the guy's knows yeah he, he manages somehow to place the bulb of his horn exactly where the <laughs> the you know crank or the button would be to take the picture so that the photographer is alarmed when what he gets is a loud honk when he goes to take the picture and it's a good match for the brazenness with which groucho assumes the role of a reporter and starts asking her questions i'll report you to your paper i'll uh, thank you to let me do the reporting is it true you're getting a divorce as soon as your husband recovers his eyesight is it true you wash your hair in clam broth? Is it true you used to dance in a flea circus? This is outrageous! It's a very good illustration of how, although it's important for them to have good material, um, it's not just about the material, because they're, they're good, funny lines, but you don't laugh out loud at them. You laugh out loud at the brazenness with which he marches in and, and uh, takes the notepad and just starts uh, machine-gunning questions at her. <laughs> And, you know, I dare you to print that, you muckrackers. I mean, it's, it's uncalled for vehemence. It's just, yes. that's what makes us laugh. And now we cut back, we see Zeppo and Mary. Uh, they apparently are have become very serious. <laughs> yes, the, much has in happened the, in the interim, yes. That, yes. yes. <laughs> From a handkerchief to, yes. to a betrothal. You're awfully glum. I was just thinking, after the boat lands, I may never see you again. Does it matter to you whether you ever see me again? I can't think of anything in the world that matters more. Mary, I'll never leave you. I I couldn't believe it when I started encountering people who said that was a funny moment or one of his funniest moments. When I was growing up with the few friends that I knew who loved the Marx Brothers, we, that was just like the most cringy, you know, better, better, better no joke than that pathetic joke. But, you know, people seem to like it. So here we go. And now we come to one of the most iconic uh, scenes in the Marx career. And it's the great uh, Maurice Chevalier passport scene as they take turns trying to get off the boat the chevalier scene i have a i have a complicated theory here which i would like to uh to waste your time with Please. let's talk about uh firstly uh, the house that shadows built because as we know this film was being made to promote paramount films the forthcoming paramount films monkey business was one of one of their big forthcoming films and at that stage they had nothing to to you know there was nothing ready so what they did as we all know and thank god they did it was uh reenact this sequence that was basically a sequence from alsatias but they made an inevitable change which was the the sequence where they do lots of impressions of the same person which uh obviously no one knows more than i do but i think was originally joe frisco and i think at later points it was jolson and maybe they they did some others as well 
obviously um yeah gallagher and sheen at one point right and, and chaplin apparently on their first british on tour. the british tour yes that's right so obviously now they're at paramount studios so obviously they're going to pick the big star the big paramount star and they do maurice chevalier but other than that it's basically that uh, that uh, i'll say she is seen so what i think we're seeing is is two bits of enormous luck as everybody acknowledges the first bit of enormous luck is that they didn't have anything from monkey business to do in that movie so they they resurrected this this i'll say she has seen which was fantastic but the but the most important thing i think is the is the chevalier switch because basically we're looking at the same joke what they're doing in the passport line is they're all doing an impersonation of the same person. And what they're doing for the theatrical agent is they're all doing the impersonation of the same, of the same person. So that can't be a coincidence. And Simon Louvish tells us that in the first uh, treatment, there was no Chevalier scene in Monkey Business. So what I think happened here is after they had done Shadows Built, they realized that what they were doing with Chevalier in that scene was so funny that they then put it into monkey business. So I think that Shadows Built came first and the Chevalier scene came from there. So we're looking at a kind of a two-way bit of amazing well, luck. The, the Shadows promoted is somehow connected to their upcoming film because maybe they felt, oh, we need to, con we need to get this into the film somehow. They do. It, it, that sketch is preceded by a title card that says, or maybe it comes after the sketch, but it says the four Marx Brothers in monkey business. So, mm. so maybe, maybe um, they, yeah, they felt compelled we have to somehow shoehorn this into the film. So I think... That, you're right, Matthew, that it's so lucky that they put it on film. I don't believe it, it could be a coincidence. It goes back to On the Mezzanine. But I just, I get the feeling that if, if, if they hadn't had anything ready for House That Shadows Built, not only would we not have this invaluable piece of footage from I'll say she is, but I suspect we also wouldn't have the Chevalier scene in Monkey Business, which is, I think, for anybody, is one of their great scenes. For me, it, it may even be the greatest. It also, in this case, gives Zeppo, although it's not a laugh line, it might be, it might be one of the most ridiculous things <laughs> a Marx brother has ever said when he says. <laughs> You've got to sing one of Chevalier's songs to get off this boat. I mean, no question of that. Okay, that is the premise we're, we're dealing with here. Well, remember in opera when Les Perry had to sing to get on the boat, apparently. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Singing is... Well, that's an interesting point. I mean, performance itself is sort of the currency of these characters. And right from the very beginning, the Marx Brothers... They sing Sweet Adeline in their barrels while fleeing the crew across the deck. They stop to do this saxophone <laughs> trio uh, with piano. Um, it is uh, the only powers they have are the powers of a vaudevillian. But it does raise this lovely idea, doesn't it? But if, whether it's you know Elvis Presley or Perry Como or Bruce Springsteen, whenever they needed to get off a boat, they had to sing. <laughs> <laughs> security, re security reasons. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine if it really was Chevalier, like if it really, if, it, <laughs> if Chevalier himself presented his passport and they said, ah, it looks pretty good, but, but let's, let's hear you sing one of Chevalier's songs. Chevalier was a Paramount star right at that same time. It probably wouldn't have been hard to get him to take part. Yeah, it almost does seem to be setting up a cameo mm. that never happens. Similarly with uh, when Groucho says Gary Cooper is much taller than I am. That's that's uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, was Rudolph Valentino, wasn't it? In in an earlier uh, in coconuts, in, yeah. And so, you know, again, Carrie Cooper is a Paramount star, but uh, they just—it's just this strange thing to get those names out, isn't it? But the studios, they were so jealously guarding their names at that point. Apparently, the punishment for stealing a passport and impersonating someone—the punishment is to go to the back of the line. <laughs> <laughs> try again <laughs> no matter what they do i mean harpo like destroys everything in sight and send them back of the line yeah, yeah. back of the line do yeah. better next time <laughs>
uh, Harpo throwing the papers in the air and stamping the bald man's head with the, you know, not, not even pretending that he's trying to like play by the rules and get off the ship. It's just the sheer joy of chaos. And doing that before as as possible. he tries to do the song. That's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't do it afterwards. <laughs> yes. He doesn't do it when he's been frustrated <laughs> in his effort to do it with the, he does it before. <laughs> yeah. Stop destroying everything and show me your passport. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's his main objective. So after that has failed, we are we see the other passengers leaving the ship and a man faints. Madame Frenchie goes looking for a doctor to help the man. And this is where my theory of who Groucho is comes into play. Doctor! 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 Are you a doctor? Sure, I'm a doctor. Where's the horse? Why, a man fainted over here. Man's fainted. I'll soon fix him. He's Hackenbush. She, it's Hackenbush. <laughs> yeah. He says, where's the horse? So, who else could it be? <laughs> yeah, it is a little a little day in the races in a bottle. Yeah. Here. Anyhow, they they carry the stretcher out and onto the deck. And, uh, and there's a man who's not related to any of them. Waving with a handkerchief. <laughs> a dapper Alsatian. <laughs> Mr. Samuel Marks is standing there, uh, right behind the brothers. But it's, only there, as far as we can tell, right? I think yeah, so. There were rumors yeah. that he was on board, and I guess it's possible that they shot it. But He could have been lost in an edit, but I've I've had every person that's ever said, no, I think he's here, I think he's there, I think he's there. It, no, he's not, because he's he's so distinctively dressed. He's wearing half black, half white. Yeah, and as I've brought up before, it's a shame that they didn't get Gummo to be up there with. Them. Yeah. That would have been fun. Yeah. yeah, that would have been nice. Yep. So the brothers are off, and they smile, they look up, and the first mate uh, uh, rubs his glasses one last time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For old time's sake. And now we cut to a short scene in apparently Elky Briggs' lair, where he's planning to kidnap Mary, and we get a nice little uh, artistic moment from Norman McLeod shooting one of the guys in a mirror delivering a line yeah they're sitting around one of them's got a saxophone ready to pose as a musician at the party <laughs> it does become a hard-boiled like film noir for just a moment here. i have no idea what you're talking about I'm, i've never seen this scene there's a mirror and one of the guys you, you're only looking at his reflection and he delivers okay. a line i'm like oh that's a he tells yeah. him to keep an eye on the daughter and he says that ought to be easy to take there is one lovely mirror shot actually that we haven't mentioned which is when uh groucho and thelma are dancing and alki comes in in, and Groucho obliviously keeps dancing. We see Thelma go into the closet in a mirror. I noticed that. Oh, oh, I noticed that. Hmm. But by this point, no, no, I didn't. I didn't spot that. <laughs> so now we cut to this wonderful party. I guess it's to welcome Mary home, and mm. uh, for some reason, it's it's a costume party. Harpo and Chico arrive on a car. They're like on the side, yeah. whatever that is, that fender or something. Why exactly are Harpo and Chico and even Groucho at this party? I guess because they work for these guys. They still do? Well, they, Harpo and Chico are refused at the door. Well, couldn't they say that they work for uh, for Joe? <laughs> they could. This whole sequence, this whole act has been massively cut down in the original scripts it's a, it's a it's a complete third act there's another a whole other day before the party and it's been it's been absolutely pared down because i think the shipboard sequence grew so much but uh, mm-hmm. it, it, yeah it is it is mysterious obviously harpo and chico both arrive in a car or on a car um in in pitch black and then we have this bizarre shot of harpo on a bike with a flower on the front chasing a girl yeah and it's in early dusk and it's the apart from the shot of uh frenchy which i presumably is just shot outside one of the hangars on the lot it's literally and the and the stock shot of the new york harbor it's the only location shot in the film and it and it fits nowhere it's in it's in early dusk he's chasing a girl Mm -hmm. who's very distinctively costumed but who doesn't appear anywhere in the interiors and I, I just don't know where that shot came from. Or who. It could have been inserted in the middle of Animal Crackers. It could have come easily. from anywhere. It's, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how they, how they got that sequence or why. A lot of people say that they, you know, the film drops off after they get off the ship. I love this party scene. Yeah, I think it's funny. I think it's very funny. I just don't think it builds. I think the idea was at this point to bring back Animal Crackers. I think the idea was, you know, right. we've had them on the ship. Now we're going to bring them back to a high society party. And rather than any kind of extended 
disruption. They just kind of, they walk on and they walk off. They say funny things, they do funny things, they enter and they exit. So it doesn't build. Uh, in the original script, it was much more of a, of a, of a third act. Oh, I have, I have a question. Sorry, I have a question. When Groucho goes off pretending to be a horse, is that Sheikman? Is that Sheikman there? Oh, I have a vested interest there. in this because obviously it is him in horse feathers, and right. and for reasons that I'm not going to go into yet, I want him to be in Animal Crackers. So so I, I is that him there? It hadn't occurred to me. I'd have to take a close look. Why don't you do that right now? <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait. <laughs> okay, I was going to bring up that same scene, but for a different reason. <laughs> go for it. Okay, bear with me here. So Groucho's doing this cowboy character. He's entertaining Joe and whatever, and he keeps doing it as he leaves the screen, and we just see Joe laughing at him, and we hear Groucho going off into the distance, and then all of a sudden we hear a horse galloping off. <laughs> yes. Did he? What? Chef, I ain't forget. <laughs> Whoa the bossy. Whoa the... <laughs> what makes it more weird is that you're just watching Joe reacting, and it's obvious that McLeod just told them to sit there for 10 seconds and then laugh. <laughs> yeah, this cowboy character is one of the tricks in Groucho's sleeve. Um, Colonel Hawkins and Day at the Races is, is a variation. It's one of the things he can do. <laughs> and so we come out in the veranda where... We see Groucho and uh, Lucille Briggs meeting again. Now, I, I also have to ask, why is Lucille Briggs at this party? I don't quite understand. Ah, very well, good that's point. That's a good question. Who invited her? Yes. <laughs> How about Groucho crawling around on the uh, railing like a, and making imitating a cat? Wow. It's very, very unusual behavior mm. even for him. He and Thelma dance a waltz wherein the music comes out of nowhere, much as they danced a tango earlier yes. in the film. It's a sort of a little mini running gag that the two of them <laughs> just have happy feet. And we meet another couple, uh, apparently. Uh, another Mogra de Mont. Yes, another one. Uh, a trysting couple. Now, was that something that might have been cut out uh, by the Hayes office? The infidelity being played for laughs like that? It might have been had they had they gone for it, yeah. And I was looking through uh, Matthew's book. He points out this strange moment of Groucho lighting a cigar and the extreme close up on the lighter. Yeah. Yes, Stuart tries to explain the joke to me, which is that he he treats a lighter as he would a match. Which okay, you know that's fair enough. That's a joke, but my God, do they overplay it with that close up? I wonder if during the Depression it was more outrageous than we realized to just throw a lighter away as though it were a match. And how long have lighters like that been around? I'm not that knowledgeable how portable lighters, maybe they were fairly new and you had to identify it. That must go back to the 19th century. But, I mean, the the notion of waste, I mean, which is a big thing the Marx Brothers too, Harpo indiscriminately tearing things up the casual way they dispense with food, uh, all of that, um, funny as it plays today, I wonder if to depression audiences, being that careless with uh, resources, yes. maybe that had a, a, a craziness to it in the 30s that we can only barely wrap our minds around. One of the first lighters was invented by the German chemist named Johann Wolfgang Dobringer in 1823. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. So you're right. You were you were you were the right century, Noah. Uh, once in a while, I get the right century. <laughs> if there's one thing you can say about Noah, he's always the right century. Well, you think of like sailors and cowboys, and they yeah. you know they must have had lighters, but uh, but um, they probably didn't just toss them aside when they were done with them. We speculated in an earlier show about the possibility of uh, Chico picking up some cash from the use of I'm Daffy Over You. Uh, mm -hmm. th this uh. is the most I'm Daffy Over You saturated film of, of all theirs. Har Harpo <laughs> plays it on the harp. Chico hums it. Chico and Harpo both separately whistle it. It's it, <laughs> yeah. and, and the main theme is it. 
kick a request in. Yes. And, and, and why not? But, but isn't it interesting that when Harpo plays it, Harpo sits down at the harp and manages to turn that song into this wistful, bittersweet, you know, kind of melancholy, but very sweet, uh, you interestingly harmonized piece of music. Mm. Uh, in Harpo's fingers, it's a whole different thing. Chico, um, and, and when we hear it on soundtracks and stuff, it's just kind of jolly, bouncy, comical theme music. Harpo makes it sort of deep in some way, profound, poetic. And he comes to the finish. Yes, he thinks of the finish. <laughs> um, in that sequence with the, um, the, the musical solos, um, when Mrs. Schmalhausen, as Groucho calls her, is singing a soprano solo, the woman who is playing the harp is another case of like someone who apparently she didn't realize from the beginning <laughs> that she was playing with her left hand <laughs> and someone else was providing the right hand. She shrieks <laughs> in astonishment when she discovers yeah, that. It's, it's easily done. And, and, I speak as a harpist. <laughs> uh, Zeppo has a, a peculiar line here with Mary. You know, Mary, everyone seems to be having nearly as much fun as I am. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> point. It's epitaph, isn't it? It should have been on his grave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So after our musical specialty numbers, we discover that Mary has been abducted. Who was that, that that came in and broke the news? Uh, Helton himself announces. No, he that, hears it from some guy who comes in and tells him. He? And we see Joe. Re- we see him reacting in another Oscar moment. Maybe Cyril Ring. Yeah. <laughs> Cyril Ring is there somewhere. If anybody listening has spotted Cyril Ring, please tell me. I've never found him. And Helton says, go and pick up a couple of guys. And Groucho says, I'll stay here and pick up a couple of dames. And the line is kind of buried in all the general excitement. It's very animal crackers. What are they planning to do? Is it supposed to be like a, a ransom thing? Because it, it, it's the it's a pretty rubbish plan, isn't it? How about the way Harpo jumps on the woman's back and Chico turns to the camera to deliver his, gee, I wish I had a horse, <laughs> um, which is a, you know, a mildly amusing line, but it's done with such stage bravado. That he, he really makes sure he gets that line in. <laughs> and as several people have brought up, uh, the film might have been just as well ending right there. <laughs> but then we'd never know what happened to Mary, and I, I'd never sleep again. And our friend Andrea would never get to see Zeppo's fisticuffs. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so we make our way out to the old barn, which is, I don't know how old it is. It's pretty old. And where is this barn? Where mm, are we Exactly. Now? We know we're in New York. The yeah. party is clearly at a city townhouse, yeah. but there's an old barn awfully close. It's a last-minute replacement for a, for a waterfront warehouse where Alki Briggs brews his hooch. Ah, because gangsters should never be glamorized. I don't have a lot to say here other than they felt compelled to make a cinematic uh, climax to this first Hollywood film. And I guess they learned their lessons. One of my favorite jokes is in there, though, which is 125th Street, 125th Street and 125th Street. (laughs) I like that. The Golden Goose Furniture (laughs) Company. But yeah, the movie sort of devolves into a lot of yelling. Mm. Zeppo saves the girl. He does. Everybody's happy. Yeah. Yep. Joe, the the unrepentant gangster, is happy. And <laughs> and we end the film with... What are you doing? I'm looking for a needle in the haystack. Sort of a half-assed way to end the film, but it might not have been the original intention, because when you watch the film, you see that after Groucho delivers the line, Chico goes over to Joe and is talking and shaking his hand as the film quickly fades out. So it's quite possible that the scene did go on for a while. Oh, it does feel like a line that might have come in the middle. Yeah. My kind of shorthand for this is, is the MGM films end, the Paramount films stop. Like like this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some incidental good gags in that scene and I, Harpo sitting backwards on the horse with the binoculars is a feels like a, a mildly iconic uh, image, but uh, but yes, they it's hard to wrap up a movie that's going nowhere. Groucho's commentary obviously anticipates the the end of At the Circus as well. Um, obviously, it's much funnier here, but uh, it's the same situation, isn't it? Yeah, and a little bit of horse feathers too um, at the football yes. game. So, any final thoughts on the, the film as a whole? Yeah, it's rubbish. I hate it. 
Uh, I think we I think we all uh, agree that the monkey business is excellent. Um, although there may be a factor here and there, you know, why it's not our you know your number one favorite or your number two favorite. Uh, there's very little to complain about, and it is, as we said at the beginning, a particularly good introduction to the Marx Brothers. Yes, and I would agree with what you said, Bob. That it is a it's a unique film. It's it's. Uh unrecognized uh, or often unrecognized as a film that uh, completely reinvents them in a way that is then not followed up there's no other film of theirs that's quite like it in the way that it presents them it deviates more from the formula than perhaps anything they did including room service yeah yeah it's a real it's a, a, a real effort has gone into saying let's take these people who are broadway comedians and turn them into hollywood comedians and it, it it opens up all sorts of new avenues that are then almost immediately closed off which is not a bad thing it's not a good thing mm-hmm. um but it's it's very uh, um i i think w- when you really look at it carefully it's uh, it's a road not taken You know, the idea of stowaways is obviously timeless and could have been at any point in their career. And if it hadn't been their first Hollywood film, perhaps the plot line would have been Groucho is the captain of the ship while the others are stowaways. Yes. It's a very cartoony film. It has many of the properties of animation and uh, a lot of cartoonists were gag men on it and worked on the screenplay. Um, and it, it certainly feels like, um, it's of a piece with comics pages of the twenties and thirties and the, the kinds of gags you would find in three and four panel newspaper strips at yeah. the time. Yeah. As a re- it's very zippy. It's very, uh, moment to moment to moment to moment. So on our scale of one to 37, what do you give this? <laughs> 42. <laughs> 36.3. So if we add those scores together and divide by a windshield wiper, <laughs> then we have the uh, certified fresh. Uh... <laughs> so that about wraps up our look at uh, monkey business. I'm sure we've missed some stuff or got some stuff wrong or just made some opinions that you totally disagree with. <laughs> if, uh, if you have any feedback, please uh, join us on our Marx Brothers Council Facebook group. And if you want to rate our podcast, we insist that you go on iTunes and give us a good rating. And thanks again to our stowaway, Andrea Orlando. Oh, yes. Thank you, Andrea. We'll have you back sometime. Yes. And Noah will come out from under the table and talk to you. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. And we're going to play you out with a song that can only be played at the end of this particular podcast. <laughs> I have no idea. What is it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But here it is. And here it is. <laughs>